Saturday, we saw the Orlando Apollos shoot for the moon to the tune of 40 points on offense, while the San Antonio Commanders commanded respect with a dominating defensive performance. Today, Garrett Gilbert looks to continue his hot play against Sean Washington and the Commanders on this President's Day weekend matchup in week two of the Alliance. And today we come to you from deep in the heart of Texas. It's the Alliance of American Football here on CBS Sports Network. Today, two 1-0 teams, the Orlando Apollos and the Commanders of San Antonio. So great to see you and be with you here for week two alongside from your first round pick, seven years in the NFL, Adam Archuleta, John Schriffen on the field. My name is Ben Holden. Adam, week one, a huge success in the Alliance. Yeah. People watch, people are interested. There's a lot of interest in this league. And for these two teams today, Orlando, all they did was put up 40. San Antonio did it with defense in week one. Well, week one for the Alliance brought a week of unknowns. And here's what I loved about watching both of these two football teams last week. Although they had slow starts, as the game went on, they got better and better and made the key plays that led to victory. They certainly did. We'll take a look back, and Orlando's offense was great. San Antonio's going to face this offense today. Uh, Garrett Gilbert shook off a slow start and threw a strike to Jalen Marshall. Marshall quickly returns a favor for the little Orlando special. And what I loved about this offense, as they opened it up, the big plays started coming. Now, for the commanders, the big plays came on defense. Three interceptions, six sacks, and then there was this, what I love to call proper hat placement, that really set the tone for the commander defense. Well said. Steve Spurrier and his Orlando Apollos invade San Antonio, where they've got another great crowd today. The Alliance comes up next. Welcome to Good Seats Still Available, a curious little podcast devoted to exploring what used to be in professional sports. Here's your host, Tim Hanlon. Hello again, everyone, and welcome. It's your pal, Tim. Tim Hanlon, that is. And, of course, you have stumbled across uh, this little podcast that we like to call Good Seats Still Available. Yes, it's our curious little podcast, our journey, our exploration, our, our, our movement into the deep and dark and wild of what used to be in professional sports. And as you you all know, what used to be doesn't necessarily have to be sort of musty and oldy and decades and centuries old, although we have gotten into some of those conversations, especially with things like baseball and the earliest days of pro football and some of the primordial ooze, if you will, of various professional sports along the way. Obviously, the further back we go, the more historical these conversations become and, uh, and, and unravel. But uh, clearly, uh, it doesn't take much uh, time to pass uh, for us to be interested in things that are no longer with us. And as we all remember from uh, our episode, oh gosh, it was maybe 113, it was not, not too, only a few weeks ago, uh, with our new pal Connor Orr uh, of Sports Illustrated, uh, we got into, I guess, our first sort of take uh, into the demise, surprising, I think, demise of the Alliance of American Football. And we continue uh, to monitor this situation uh, as uh, the weeks and months play out. And uh, we are going to uh, use uh, some of the uh, latest developments to uh, be the excuse for this week's episode uh, with Michael Rothstein from ESPN.com. Uh, and uh, he, along with uh, his uh, football uh, writing colleague at ESPN, Seth Wickersham, wrote a, uh, a great piece back in uh, June 13th, I think it was, about two weeks ago from when we were recording this, uh, called Inside the Short, Unhappy Life of the Alliance of American Football. And uh, much like Connor's uh, piece from uh, a few weeks back in Sports Illustrated, this uh, goes back into uh, some of the play-by-play, -play, shall we say, of the demise of this league, uh, the last days and uh, some of the precursors of such. Michael's and Seth's piece on ESPN.com, I highly encourage you to pause this episode now and read it uh, fully, maybe before coming back. We'll wait. Uh, just kidding. For those who've already listened uh, or read it, uh, we wanted to go deeper uh, because there are clearly some more uh, interesting tidbits. And every time we sort of uh, sense that there's some new uh, items uh, to be um, uh, delved into, we're going to we'll keep bringing back this story because it's one that will continue to fascinate as things play out. And uh, as many of you know, uh, last couple of days uh, when we're recording this, I would argue, and this was that we kind of just found this out maybe a day or two after we recorded our, our, our conversation with uh, with Michael. The latest sort of major development is that uh, Tom Dundon, who was the supposed savior, sort of last minute or actually past minute uh, savior of this league in the midst of it, and then 
uh, ultimately w- wound up uh, being, I guess, the reason why uh, the plug was pulled because the money was then not forthcoming and and you know he was clearly in control after having sort of saved the day, so to speak. He wants his money back. Apparently, Dundon does. He wants his seventy million dollars back uh, from this league that no longer exists. It'll be interesting to find out uh, how that plays out in the courts, uh, where that money potentially comes from, given the fact that uh, it is indeed bankrupt and has been essentially liquidated. But uh, let's put it this way: this is this is a league that, uh, despite all its promise, its optimism, uh, and frankly, I think some really good things that will probably you know uh, not sort of be. I guess, appreciated until maybe months or years down down the road in terms of some of the innovations and the process and the 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 uh, the vision, I guess, will not go quietly. And uh, certainly Tom Dundon, you know, done, done pretty well for himself in, in the world of subprime loans and and the, the Carolina hurricanes of the NHL and sports and all that kind of stuff. I, I can't get into the specifics of it, but um, 70 million dollars is a lot of money to sort of, quote unquote, throw away. And uh, I guess he wants his money back. And and so this is the story that we'll keep on giving. And um, we are uh, excited, uh, maybe not so excited about, you know, uh, the reasons for such, but we are excited to have met uh, and uh, have a tremendous conversation uh, getting into uh, some of the further intrigue of the AAF with Michael Rothstein uh, of ESPN.com. And uh, we're going to get to that conversation uh, in a minute or so. So I encourage you to stay tuned to that. You will learn some new things and uh, you can add it to your pile of ever growing knowledge about the Alliance of American Football. We are brought to you this week uh, through the good graces of our new friends at The Great Courses Plus. The place in particular to go to is thegreatcoursesplus.com slash good seats. And what are you going to get when you go there? Well, you will be whisked away uh, to a page that will invite you to a free month for a limited time of The Great Courses Plus service. And what is The Great Courses Plus, you ask? Well, We like to think of it as unlimited video learning with the world's greatest professors. And for sure, uh, that's what you're going to get when you uh, you get a taste of uh, what the Great Courses Plus uh, has to offer. There are lectures and presentations from some of the uh, best uh, teachers on the planet, Uh, some of them from uh, uh, highly esteemed universities, others uh, experts in their fields. And we're talking about things like health and fitness, uh, hobbies, food and wine, uh, science and history and mathematics and personal and professional development, lots of topics and lots of intriguing coursework, again, without the without the tests and without the uh, the stress of, of cramming for exams and whatnot. Uh, and this is content that is uh, not only coming from some of the best professors out there, but it's in conjunction uh, with some of the uh, great uh, museums and associations out there uh, to lend their uh, expertise to this coursework. Uh, for example, places like the Culinary Institute of America and National Geographic and, and the Smithsonian for God's sakes. And uh, we are especially excited uh, to uh, uh, give you some incentive uh, to get your free month at thegreatcoursesplus.com slash good seats because we are um, obsessed with a a brand new course that they just launched about a week or two ago. And it is called Play Ball. And it is uh, basically a uh, 24, count them, lecture series uh, devoted to uh, some of the earliest history of baseball uh, in this country. Like I said, it's produced in conjunction uh, with the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum in uh, beautiful Cooperstown, New York. Uh, And uh, these uh, courses are all around some of the things that we've talked about on this uh, this show, Uh, things like uh, the early days of uh, of labor relations and uh, the early days of uh, professionalism as baseball was kind of rounding the corner in the late 1800s from purely an amateur situation into that of professionalism. Uh, and frankly, not uh, with open arms. A lot of people kind of thought professionalizing baseball would would actually lead to uh, uh, things like ill repute and uh, and other sort of uh, dangers and evils. But um, uh, you will love this series called Play Ball, this sort of early history uh, of American baseball, very much intertwined with the history of America itself. Uh, let alone, that is the uh, a, a great incentive to uh, go to thegreatcoursesplus.com slash good seats to get your free month, not only of the baseball series, uh, but anything within the Great Courses Plus, a smattering of offerings. Uh, it is streaming video. It is available online uh, via the app that they've got. Uh, you can stream it to any device. And the cool thing about this app is you can download it 
meaning uh, if you don't have a, uh, an internet uh, connection or a broadband connection, you can download these courses for, for playing, say, on an airplane or a long car ride or whatever. Or you can even listen to the lectures in audio only format, if you'd like, in case you're busy doing other things, uh, yet you still want to learn in the background. Again, that's the Great Courses Plus, the Great Courses Plus dot com slash good seats for your free month of the Great Courses Plus service, including and especially the great series uh, of lectures from uh, Bruce Markerson uh, at the uh, National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum uh, devoted to the series Play Ball, all about the early days of American baseball history. We uh, we uh, think it's really cool. We encourage you all to try it and uh, we hope you enjoy it as much as we do. And let us know uh, if you do. I suspect that uh, you absolutely and mightily will. Hopefully you will mightily also enjoy our conversation into our sort of second dive into the, the short span of life of the Alliance of American Football with uh, with our pal Michael Rothstein from ESPN.com. And here is our conversation that we had literally just last week. Please enjoy. So before we get into this, uh, your background, uh, how long you've been with ESPN? What have, what are your beats been? Uh, have you always been into sports reporting, uh, that kind of stuff? And then let's segue into how you uh, sort of decided to delve into the AAF so quickly after its demise. Yeah, sure. Um, so brief little history. Uh, grew up in New York, went to Syracuse, like, I don't know what, probably half of sports journalism, I guess. And then moved to a small town in California, was there for a year covering high schools and minor league baseball the, coincidentally enough the minor league baseball team that i covered is no longer in existence the league is the team's not so you know maybe i'll be back again one day uh to talk about the uh high desert, Ma- high desert mavericks although i would not have much history there to really share with you other than they were the worst team in hey, minor league the baseball more, when the I more covered obscure them. the better we love that kind of here that stuff here so yeah um and then uh then moved to virginia for a couple of years where i covered a bunch of stuff from division three football to d1 football to d1 women's basketball to high schools then i moved to indiana where i covered again a a hodgepodge of stuff but really focused on notre dame football and notre dame basketball and then some indy car and high schools again and then in 2009 i moved to michigan where i was hired to cover michigan football football and basketball and then in 2011 espn hired me first to cover Michigan football, Michigan basketball, and then in 2013, I moved to cover the NFL with a heavy focus on the Detroit Lions, and that is where I have been since, and basically what happened, how the AAF kind of popped on my radar screen was, I'm always looking for interesting stories, and my bosses know that, I'm always willing to kind of take on challenges and take on interesting stuff. I I mean, really, I do some UFC and MMA now. I've written stories about various things in the city of Detroit. Uh, I've covered some NBA. So I've done a little bit of of everything here on the side when the NFL season isn't going on. And they basically, my bosses came to me in the middle of January and said, hey, listen, there's this new league called the Alliance of American Football. I was like, yeah, I'm obviously familiar with it. Uh, They're like, do you want to go down a training camp in San Antonio and cover it, kind of just go find some stories, see what's going on? And I said, sure, I'm in Michigan. It's cold and snowing. I'll go to Texas for a week. And moreover, it was, I thought, a potentially really interesting assignment. I had actually just finished reading not too long before that, I, I don't, I can't remember the exact timeline. Maybe it was a couple months or not. Uh, Jeff Perlman's book on the USFL, which was a fantastic look, obviously so many years later, at that league. Yes, and, and a former guest of ours, and he was uh, tremendous. He he brought it as uh, as I knew he would. Yeah, so I read that book, and, and Jeff brings it, and it, with every book that he does, uh, he his podcast is fantastic. It's generally one of the ones I'm listening to when I am trudging on the treadmill or on the bike most mornings. And that really intrigued me of like, well, you know, I read that book. I remember NFL Europe and the World League of American Football because I was just old enough to really remember that stuff. I'm 38 right now. And 
I was like, you know what? Let's all right. Yeah, let's do it. Like, sure. I'm tired. It's just from an off season, but yeah, let's, let's absolutely do it. You know, thanks for the assignment. I appreciate it. Thanks for some confidence in me. So I went down there for four or five days and it was interesting being down there. Then uh, the access was pretty good. Basically whatever players I needed, I got GMs. I got for the most part coaches. I got for the most part, they got me Charlie Ebersol for an hour. Or so they got me Bill Polian for about 40 minutes and it could have been longer, but a couple of things stood out at one being, they actually wouldn't let me in to the Alamo Dome. I went down there specifically because I was told that that was when they were going to have their their practice games, their run-through games. So I figured, okay, this is the best way to see what what the football is going to be like because that was a big question. The question at that point wasn't the money. It was, well, what's this football going to be like? Well, you know, you see the issues of quarterback development and offensive line development in the NFL, and these are players below that or, or cast-offs from it. How, how's this really going to go? And I really only was able to see a walkthrough just because of the timing of when I was there before these practice games. And then they wouldn't let me in the practice games. And some people wanted to let me in. Some people wouldn't. And I'm sorry. This was what time now? What time of the year was this? this oh, sorry. Yeah, this was uh, right at the end of January. It was right at the end of training camp. It was about 10 days before the season started. It was it. the only time they had had really scrimmages slash games against one another. And each team was scheduled to play one other team over the course of two days in the Alamo Dome. I think it was done as much to test the technology, to test the, what the TV stuff would look like, as much as it was to test the football, to see what the football was. So I'm there and I'm really, I'm pretty sure the only media member from a national outlet there, I might be the only independent media person there, period, outside of the people in San Antonio at that point in time. And they won't let me into the Alamo Dome. Like they just wouldn't let me in. Like I, I, I actually sat outside the Alamo Dome. I didn't try too hard to get in because it was actually pretty secure. But I actually sat outside the Alamo Dome to see if I saw some of the people I knew from the league to see if they would get me in because I was there. I wanted to see football, right? So I was just very thrown by that a little bit of, wait a minute, like what are you hiding? Why won't you let me in to see this are you worried that it's that bad like what's going on here in the back of my head i'm thinking that like to me that is something that sounds odd sounds like a juxtaposition from the uh, almost uh, uh i want to say carte blanche but certainly more open access that you were given earlier no yeah it was it was i was basically given everything and uh, except for that and like i said there were some people who wanted me in there and there were others that weren't and then there was i remember specifically one coach i'm not going to say who it was that i was talking to afterward and they were like oh so you were there right i'm like no and uh that coach showed me some game film and it, when i saw that i'm like all right this looks like football and he's like yeah it does i'm like okay so you, you saw the product and i kind of knew the product was going to be okay based off of what i saw off a of scrimmage at that point it was slower than the nfl but that was to be expected to me it was a little slower than high-end college football but i think that was to be expected especially at that time of year it was their first ever game it it looked very much like your pre i, I compared it to your preseason fourth game because that's really what a lot of these players are the equivalent to are those players that are playing in the fourth preseason game, either for those last few spots on the roster or they're getting cut three, four days, two, you know, two, three, four days later. So I go back after that. I talk to my bosses. I'm like, yeah, I think they're, you know, it's got a shot and, and everything. There's no indication at that point. I had actually heard a couple of rumblings here and there that maybe there are some finance questions, but nothing overbearing at that point. Uh, I'd actually heard from one person the name Reggie Fowler down there. I tried to track him down and I couldn't actually get a hold of him for a couple of weeks because, uh, you know, I, I, but at that point, no one knew what was actually going on with him, which was he basically had really kind of the money had dried up and that also, oh, yeah, he was about to be arrested a few months later on, on federal charges. So at that point, we don't know, you know, no one knows that. So. I go back and I come home for a little, I come actually come back to New York for another story I was reporting. And then I flew out to Orlando for one of the first games. And 
because they had two for, they had two games that opening night, right? They had the San Antonio Arizona game, which pretty much everybody saw, and then a small pocket of the country saw it, saw Orlando Atlanta. And just to give you an idea of kind of how maybe disorganized some of this was, before I booked the trip to Orlando, I had asked a couple of people in the league. I'm like, what game is going to like, is, is it going to be a 50, 50 split? Is one of these games going to be heavily over the other one? And they didn't have an answer uh, of a TV coverage map. So I sat there and I said, well, it's just in San Antonio. Steve Spurrier, is, Steve Spurrier is really intriguing to me. I knew some of the players on the Atlanta team already. Because I, had co- because I had covered them either in college or in the NFL or in one case, in the case of Malachi Jones, I knew his brother, TJ Jones, who played for the Lions fairly well. So I'm like, you know what, this is maybe a better shot for me to get a really interesting story just based off of who I know, not knowing at that point that the majority of the country is going to see the San Antonio game. But the other thing with that game of which, and this kind of went away, you know, and people kind of forgot about it for the most part is Michael Vick was supposed to make his debut as an offensive coordinator in that Orlando Atlanta game. So to me, I'm sitting there, I'm like that, those are some amazing storylines. You have Michael Vick, who's maybe the biggest name this league has overall, and he's a coordinator and and he's going to make his debut. And then you have Steve Spurrier, who's maybe the second biggest name that this league has as the opposing coach on the other sideline. And Oh yeah, he's the best quote in the league. And there's never a question about that. Right. Because if it's Steve Spurrier versus anybody, Steve Spurrier is going to be the best quote. So to me that, that made sense to go to that game. And then only, I think, I think the number was like 12 or 13. And I, I could be completely off with that percent of the country ended up seeing that game. Why do you think CBS even had two games or, or why, sorry, the league scheduled two games simultaneously as their first go around? I mean, you know, I have no idea. I, I, I have no idea. I never, I never really asked that question. Uh, it, it was something that, I, yeah, I, I don't, I couldn't to this day tell you why they did that, especially because every other schedule that they had was they never had a game go up against another game. And I, I think they were maybe trying to create a big Saturday night and, you know, maybe give CBS some options. I, I really couldn't tell you the answer to that question. Anything I would say would be just a complete guess. It just would be. But that night, the league actually, I think, had the best night in the history, in the very, very short history of their league, because they had a viral moment with Mike Perkovici's helmet popping off in that San Antonio, Arizona game. And that went viral. I remember seeing that on Twitter while I was sitting in the Orlando press box. And then you had Orlando, which ended up being the best team in the league, actually looking like a really capable offense. You had Garrett Gilbert, who actually looked like an NFL level quarterback. And it was a really exciting game to be at. And then the next day, and two days later, the ratings come back and the ratings are great. The people are actually interested. They wanted to see what was going on. So I remember even talking to a couple of people around the league in those next few days and just basically saying, hey, you guys had a really good night. You had a really good night. And they're like, yeah, we did. And we'll see what happens. And, you know, from there, kind of, to me, that was the high point. <laughs> and, and I think from there, everything kind of slowly started to unravel away. So, all right. So, based on your, I know that was long winded. So, no, this is great. No, I, this is. I mean, we're looking for. I mean, you know, we love first person stuff, right? And this is. Uh, you're obviously a first person. You were right there, you know, on the field in the stadium for one of the two debut games for sure. Uh, plus, also the, the the prelude to all of that stuff. So, it, based on your reporting instincts, right uh, in the stadium, uh, obviously a, a pretty good uh, sense of of the storylines, which I think is is extremely accurate the way you set them up. And before knowing two days later what the ratings were and stuff, what what was your, you know, aside from your little maybe, you know, antenna uh, uh, issue uh, from, you know, the the uh, the preseason kind of stuff and getting a chance to look at the football before the game. What was your sense of the of the first game and it's uh, the performance and and in the stadium and stuff? It sounds like it was off to a good start with very little to sort of criticize. Yeah, I, I thought it was off to a very positive start. I had heard rumblings at that point. Uh, again, from from a, a source, but it wasn't something I, for whatever reason, I was, wasn't able to get it confirmed. And it, again, it was one of those things of I started a file pretty early on. I think I don't remember if it was before that first week or if it was right after of just like things I've heard that were a little off or, 
you know, things that I saw that, that kind of just, just have that file just in case, right? And one of them was that the Orlando team was going to be practicing in Georgia. And that the Salt Lake team, which by this point was known, wasn't going to be in Salt Lake, and they were staying in San Antonio. Now, it, it got played off a couple different ways, but the truth was, and I had heard this, was that they're just, their facilities weren't ready yet. And obviously it comes to later, and in that story, in the, the story that Seth Wickersham and I wrote, that it's in there that basically, yeah, the reason that Salt Lake didn't have was because the facilities were were still being built because there was issues on a lot of levels with what they were going to be. And Salt Lake kind of had those problems from the jump, even on the business offices, because, I mean, when they hired their team president, and this is getting really into Louise, but when they hired their team president, and again, this is in the story, that first meeting that he had, and it was two employees, it was him and uh, one of his vice presidents, I'm just blanking on which one it was at the moment, they met in a McDonald's because they had free Wi-Fi. And they met there a couple of days, and then as he as they started to hire out more employees, they moved from the McDonald's to splitting between time in rice Eckley Stadium and a conference room and a conference room at Datatix, which was their ticket broker. And that was where they worked for the first month. So Salt Lake always had a problem. Uh, and none of that stuff really was known until later, uh, until really kind of we uncovered it as far as the McDonald's stuff and things and, you know, the ticketing office problems and not the ticketing office problems, but the business office problems. The the other stuff, the football office problems were known because they just weren't there. They, there, were, there were league people who actually beat the team to Salt Lake City. As far as like, so they they had no kickoff event in Salt Lake City. They they basically were a team without a home. Uh, in my reporting, and this didn't make the story. One person had told me that they one of the jokes around the office was that they called themselves you know the Salt Lake Stallions of San Antonio because they just weren't there. So you again you start to hear those things. I didn't hear those some of those particular things until much later. But I started to file. And, and this is all a long answer for saying that night, however, you couldn't have guessed that it would be gone six weeks later, especially in Orlando. They had a good fan base. There were people tailgating. I figured I would show up there. No joke. Uh, because I showed up a couple hours before the game, maybe 90 minutes before. And I thought I would be driving in and it would be like a high school. I, so I grew up on Long Island, right? And High school football games on Long Island are Saturday afternoons. They're not particularly well attended, at least not at the high school I went to. And I thought it would be that. There'd maybe be 500 people there, maybe 1,000, maybe 2,000, because there wasn't a ton of promotion done. There wasn't a ton of marketing done. Think about it. A week before during the Super Bowl, I figured you would see a ton of AAF promotion during that game, right? Like every football fan is watching that, and every person who doesn't even like football is watching the Super Bowl. And you rarely saw anything about the Alliance of American Football. Again, that was a flag to me of like, well, why are, why are they not? Sure, ads are expensive, but why are they not doing more in-game stuff? Like, why is this not being brought up over and over and over again? Especially because it's going to be on CBS a week later. So all that said, there were fans there. And they, they cared. They had bought season tickets. I remember walking around the parking lot uh, of UCF Stadium which is where the Orlando Apollos played. Yes, yeah, spe- spe- Spectrum Stadium, not not a bad choice, right? Not the Camp right. World Stadium, which is the giant, you know, formerly Citrus Bowl and, you know, impeding on the Orlando City soccer thing. It was a, a college football venue with with decent seating and uh, an ambiance, you know, for what it's worth. Yeah, absolutely. And they knew how to handle parking. They knew how to handle crowds. Um, and you you walk through there and there, listen, there weren't a ton of fans there. I'm not going to say this was like a full house or anything like that, but there were fans who cared. There were fans who started like Facebook pages and fan clubs. And they had, in, they were excited because they had football in Orlando and they had interaction with the team president who was Michael Waddell, who was very involved and they had interaction with players. And there was just all of this excitement from people and from fans who had not, because again, remember, they had not seen any sort of product. They had not seen any sort of football. It's not like there was even a ton of coverage. Sure, some people were excited because Steve Spurrier and what, you know, you know Steve Spurrier is going to run an interesting offense, and he ran Philly Special in that first game. But you see all those things, and I'm sitting there, I'm like, how are you already a fan? And they're just like, I wanted this. 
And I'm like, okay, I get it. I, I get, I get, I get what they're trying to do. Maybe they have a shot if they can build this out of nothing, right? I mean, this is like spinning something out of like cloth that doesn't exist. You know, <laughs> like I, I, it's funny as we're talking, I kind of think of the Emperor's New Clothes. You know, that that childhood, you know, tale, because they had woven this great thing and and they had built an audience where there was nothing to build it around other than the the promise and the specter of football. And then you watch the game and Atlanta's a mess. That team is, that team's just bad. They, they had lost Brad Childress. who was supposed to be their head coach. Michael Vick, it turned out never really was around as far as being an offensive coordinator. So Kevin Coyle, who was a defensive coordinator ended up taking over as head coach, like four days in a, in a practice. And, yeah, he's his first time head coach, so he doesn't even have a ton. So this is his, this is his shot. This is the opportunity that he'd been waiting his whole career for that he thought would never come, right? And it's coming in this situation. So they were they were disorganized from from the jump, and you saw that, and you're like, okay, but you didn't know all of that. Some of the back stuff at that point, because the Michael Vick stuff only kind of started to peter out a little bit this that week, and then. Jeff Fisher, after the game, comes in a press conference and basically says, yeah, Michael Vick's not even here, and we're, we're moving him away from the Atlanta organization. He's going to take a role in the league office, and that was the last you heard about Michael Vick. And you, you, so you saw all of these things, but that night, that game, I, you thought it was positive. There were fans there. Players were excited. They were, I remember it, it started raining right almost as the game ended, and players still – hung around, they went to the stands and they signed autographs and they were super excited and they felt really good about what they had produced on the field. And really, like I said, that night felt like a win and it especially felt like a win in Orlando. And from talking to people later, they felt the same way in San Antonio. And, and there's bits and pieces of that in, in the piece about that first night in San Antonio, which again, I wasn't at, but you could tell in both places they felt really good about what what they had and i don't think it was done you know let me rephrase that it was done i think because they had a feeling that it would be successful in san antonio and orlando and those truthfully ended up being maybe their two best markets because those two fan bases really embraced the idea of spring football and the idea of the alliance of american football and really showed that they could be sustainable because they were they were good markets and they had good fan bases again built from almost nothing. Now not every team could say that. There were issues in Memphis. There were problems in Birmingham. Salt Lake had some issues. Arizona had some issues. Atlanta had a lot of issues as far as drawing fans, but those two places didn't. So, okay, at what point after that first Saturday does your reporting shift or tilt from quality of play and on the field stuff and stories to maybe the bigger sort of tableau of issues outside of it. Yeah, I would say probably the second that Tom Dundon announced that they were getting, they, he was giving $250 million that ended up not being $250 million to the Alliance of American football. The second that happens and very soon after, I had heard some questions about payroll, and that had gotten out there really quickly as well, that I'm like, well, wait a minute, that's a little bit, that's a little bit off. And then to me, it flashed with something that I had been told while I was in San Antonio. That, and again, this was part of the reason I was reaching, trying to reach out to Reggie Fowler at that point, was you know that he had given this substantial amount of money to kind of keep things afloat in December. Uh, but I was never able to get Reggie Fowler on the phone. And the information I was given was, was not entirely right because I was told it was to keep seeing it to keep Salt Lake going. Um, which I mean, Reggie Fowler was heavily involved in the Salt Lake process because he was the one who came up with the idea for shipping containers. And he was the, you know, and that was part of where that money went. So it was kind of, but we never, I never reported it because I didn't have a good handle on it. And unless I got Reggie Fowler on the phone again, we didn't know that Reggie Fowler was going to have the issues that he had. Right. So I was just like, okay, if I can't get him on the phone, I can't necessarily get the information I want. I can't report that. 
you know, but I, I had heard that name and a, and a number and the number that I'd heard was a little bit off from the number that it ended up being. So again, that was just in my file. But once the Dundon thing happened, yeah, my antenna went up and I was just like, all right, that was when I really started making sure, Hey, I got to write down everything that kind of that happens that I'm like, Hmm, that's a little bit odd. I need to go chase that. I need to confirm that. Or, Hey, maybe I'm not going to chase it at this moment because Again, you, you you have to remember, like, you're not. Co- I wasn't covering the AAF like every day. You know, it was I was watching some of the games. I would write some of the bigger stuff, um, but it wasn't a day to day beat for me. So I was just kind of keeping track more than anything else in case something happened. Or at the end of the first season, success or failure, then all right, I have places to go to maybe write something of like what happened, you know, in the first year of the AAF, and I just kind of kept taking notes. And if they had conference calls, I would jump on conference calls and I would be writing some features and I'd be talking to some players and some execs around the league intermittently. Um, It was kind of one of those things. I mean, because that Orlando game was the last game I went to and it became something where I just became kind of the de facto Alliance of American football beat writer because I was, I had gone to training camp and I had had some contacts within the league. So, and then every Sunday I had, I think, except for one during the existence of the league, I ended up doing a, a hit on ESPN radio with uh, Myra Medcalf and Mark, Sh- and not Mark, Matt Schick. And they dubbed me the AAF insider, which became kind of a little joke. And, but every Sunday there was something to talk about because that was one of the things that ended up happening was every Monday or Tuesday in the existence of the league, Something happened that became newsworthy. Something. Whether it was Tom Dundon, whether it was Robert Vanich filing a lawsuit against Charlie Ebersol saying that Charlie Ebersol stole the idea from the league from Robert Vanich. You know, I, I mean, and it, the list goes on. The Johnny Menzel stuff possibly coming out, you know, of, of him possibly joining the league and then joining the league. It was all of these things one after another. I think the uh, I think the Georgia Orlando thing came out on a Monday or a Tuesday, if I remember correctly. That might have been a different part of the week. It, it all kind of blurs together that six eight week period. And yeah, I mean, it just kind of went from there. I know that that's a, maybe a long weird answer, but it, it just kind of was every week. It seemed like it was something, and probably about like three or four weeks in, I kind of think you know. I can't imagine this thing would go away after a first year, but I surely don't necessarily think there might be a second. Like there's just, there's just so much stuff going on here, right? Like that's just kind of strange. And then there were started reports started coming out that Tom Dundon's 250 million wasn't really 250 million. Uh, It was a little bit, it was, you know, less than that. And it was more a week to week thing. I I forget if sports business journal had that or, or someone had that from Dundon saying that and you're like okay that's that's a little weird but how much truth is there to that because then you have bill polian on a conference call saying that the money that dundon gave was something that could really give them a chance to plan out for the long haul so you had that you know different people saying different things and i think once you kind of dug into it after, like, you know, after this is all over and Seth and I are, are peeling back layers and talking to people and finding out all of these things, it makes so much more sense why there were different messages from different people while the leak was going on once you found out after. Because at that at that time, it's just like, well, wait, what's going on? Why why do they not have a consistent message? Well, it seems to me that, that the football, despite all these things on the outside, and I, I guess at some point, you know, your original – premise was to sort of follow this as as a football story, right? The, the, the stories of the various uh, players and, and and maybe how does it align or not with the NFL and, and the, you know, staving off the XFL and it's spring football. I mean, there are a lot of sort of uh, earnest, I guess, uh, storylines, right, uh, about the desire, the interest, the uh, second chances, redemptions, if you will, around playing the game of uh, a pro football, right? And lots of legacy earlier stories of of, of of leagues that have tried and failed to to do so. But at some point, it sounds like uh, you're getting overwhelmed, frankly, with reporting on, quote unquote, the other stuff. And it's got to be a bit daunting. But I, in the midst of all of that, though, uh, describe to me how you felt or found the players and the coaches, because it seems to me now as as an outsider watching the games on, on television over every weekend, 
uh, that the quality of play was not only stable, but was actually progressively getting a bit better despite all these distractions. I would agree with that. Uh, yeah, I, th- I think the play, quality of play definitely got better week to week. Now, again, I, I don't live in, a, I, I don't think I live within 800 miles. Maybe, maybe Memphis might be closer than 800 miles, but I don't live within a long distance of any of these cities. So I wasn't around these players and these coaches. When I would have conversations with them, it would be very, very brief. Usually it would be follow-ups for, you know, either checking in or just, hey, what's going on, or follow-ups on stories that I had reported in training camp that were going to eventually run. Uh, and I, there were three, or f- there were at least two or three that ended up never seeing the light of day because the league folded before we got there. <laughs> You know, I actually, the day the league folded, I was transcribing uh, interviews from a story I'd reported in, in late January, and I actually called that player the next day. I was like, hey, so, or I think it was a Monday, so it was the day before, and then the day the league folded, or the, there were reports were out there, I called that player, and I was like, hey, so listen, I was actually going to call you because I had questions about this, but I don't think that that's running now. Like, what have you heard about this? And we talked for a few minutes. So, I... The the vibe I got was that, I mean, they were playing football and everybody, and, and this goes back to January, the vast majority of people who were in this league were in it for the same reason, which is they wanted to either get one of two things. They want another shot in the NFL, and that goes for GMs, coaches, players, you know, random assorted front office staff. Or, or get into the league for the first time in a lot of way, in a lot of cases with younger people, or they want a closure. You know, they, they, people like Steve Spurrier to me were never going to go back to the NFL. That's not why he was doing this. He just wanted to coach football again and, and get some closure. Mike Martz told me he didn't want to go back to the NFL. He just wanted to do this to get back to the game. There were some players who were like, you know what? If I get back to the NFL, great. If not, I'm able to end this on my own terms. And and that was kind of the other reason why they were there. So to me, you know, they all kind of understood what was going on and they all to a person knew that, listen, there were going to be bumps in the road on this. I, I think the the words I heard the most often from players when I did talk to them were like, yeah, it's a startup, like things are going to happen. And, and that was a pretty consistent theme through through a good portion of really my time covering the league until uh, it no longer existed. But, but it also sounds to me that, especially based on on, on the story that uh, that you and Seth wrote, uh, and again, I'd see on, on ESPN.com, it's it's worth the read, and I, I suspect there are other stories yet to come from all of this as as things further play out. But you know, one of the senses that I got in your piece was that I think you know it, it comes across to me at least that that Charlie Ebersol, you know cared like he kind of really wanted to make this thing work and 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 do right by the players and get the football right and and by getting somebody like Bill Polian who you know who was the guy in charge of all the football stuff I it feels to me like if anything you know could be given full marks for right despite all the other things that have happened in such a short period of time the football was not the problem per se and especially in terms of aligning with the rationale of why players and coaches wanted to be part of all this, despite it being a startup. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, the football, I mean, the football worked or largely worked. Uh, I I think there are always things you can do better. And I'm guessing that they would have found things that they could do better in in year two with the football if they had gotten to a year two. But the football worked. I mean, the ratings were mostly stable, you know, on whatever network they were on. Obviously, they never really hit the – the level that they got in week one, but that's because you're on CBS and they hadn't had a game on CBS after that. Of course, they were about to have a game on CBS as a lead into the final four, but they folded four days before that, three or four. My math is, is off today. Yeah, four days before that, I think five, whatever it is. They folded right before they were about to have another potential huge audience. But people found them on NFL Network, on CBS Sports Network, on TNT. They they found the games. Those games were going to be again on CBS, which was not the original schedule of of the games. I think that was kind right. of a a thing done sort of in midstream. No, yeah, they were all, the next game that was supposed to be on CBS after the opener was 
I believe it was the title game that was supposed to be in Las Vegas and then got moved to Frisco, Texas, uh, which, by the way, when we were talking about things that were raising major flags for me, that one was another one because I actually called UNLV to be like, hey, did, did you know about this? Because they still, when they moved the game, uh, I know we're kind of bouncing around here, but when they moved that title game, UNLV, Sam Boyd Stadium, they still had ads and you could buy tickets for the game at UNLV when they had just announced that they were moving it to to Texas. So I, I called UNLV and I was like, hey, you know, are you guys just slow to take this down? Like, what's going on here? And they were like, we didn't know until they announced it that the game was no longer going to be in Vegas. And then I foia a contract and I never got a response back about a contract. So, yeah, that like I said, there were there were flags that were being raised throughout um, when it came to certain things. And I know we're kind of bouncing around a little bit and I apologize. But, yeah, going back to the question, yeah, the, there was clear at least enough. I, to me, there was enough interest on the football side of things that, yeah, CBS is going to give them a little bit more you know, a little bit more run on the big time network. And initially a lot of those games that were on TNT were supposed to be streamed on Bleacher Report and they ended up on TNT instead. And I think that's because they showed that people were actually tuning in to watch. All right, let's take a break. Let's uh, tell you about our friends at thegreatcoursesplus.com. I think you've heard me talk to uh, you about them uh, in a few other episodes, but The Great Courses Plus is unlimited video learning with the world's greatest professors. Uh, and uh, we're talking about all kinds of uh, topics, uh, almost uh, college-like, if you will, uh, across a wide array of subjects that uh, will interest just about every interest that you might have across the realms of science and economics and art and hobbies and personal or professional development, history, uh, you name it, there is a course or two or many uh, devoted to those topics and more at thegreatcoursesplus.com. And as as you've heard me also say, uh, there is a, a tremendous new course uh, now available, uh, their first real deep dive into the realm of sports. Uh, it's called Play Ball, the Rise of Baseball as America's Pastime. It is created in partnership with the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum. Uh, it is taught uh, by uh, the Hall's Bruce Markison, and it's about 24 uh, lectures uh, deep uh, into some of the uh, most interesting developments in the uh, in the rise of the sport of baseball uh, in this country. And, and it, it does uh, cross into a bunch of different topics uh, that we've kind of scratched the surface on here on this little show. Uh, you know, we've talked about, for example, the reserve clause. Uh, and its impact on uh, the players and the ownership and the business models uh, of baseball. Uh, there's a, an entire course or lecture devoted to that. Uh, there's an episode uh, devoted to American politics uh, and baseball. Uh, we've uh, had a couple of, uh, of conversations sort of around that. Uh, the impact of war on the sport of baseball. Uh, and just many, many more. Uh, and it's, it's a tremendous opportunity uh, to learn and it doesn't feel like learning folks it really doesn't uh, it's a video streaming service it is available online uh, in app form you can stream it to any device and the really cool thing about the app is you can actually download all the uh, courses if you'd like if you're not going to be near an internet connection or you can even listen to it in audio only format uh, let's say you're driving and uh, can't uh, be uh, uh, be bothered with the visuals it is, it is an amazing course. This course in particular, Play Ball, the Rise of, Amer of Baseball as America's Pastime, but literally all the hundreds of other courses uh, that you can try for free for one month when you use uh, our special URL. That's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash good seats. Again, one free month of the entire Great Courses uh, a cadre of offerings. Yours uh, to try for free an entire month for a limited time, thegreatcoursesplus.com slash good seats. Does this sound too good to be true? You bet it does, but it ain't. It's uh, it's absolutely legit. Uh, I, I guarantee you're going to find these uh, these lectures to be interesting. And this one in particular about the rise of baseball uh, with Bruce Markison from the uh, National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum. Give it a try. If not for anything, for this series alone, the baseball series, get an entire free month of that as well as all the other great stuff at thegreatcoursesplus.com slash good seats. 
We appreciate the Great Courses Plus for their sponsorship. And we, of course, appreciate you listening to the remainder of our conversation right now. You're obviously your antenna gets raised to start to maybe sort of piece together some of the things that ultimately wind up become becoming obvious as as these sort of things come together. I mean, you do mention the uh, the rescheduling or the movement of the championship game. That certainly was probably from my outsider's perspective, uh, probably the biggest uh, red flag of them all. But even despite all of that, right, it answer me this. Did, did you even when you saw those things happening and your reporting was telling you you know, some things were not uh, were not adding up and, and perhaps even hastening into some further, you know, into demise a little bit more quickly. Did you even imagine uh, that they would just pull the plug before ending the season? I mean, did, it would seem to me that that finishing the season by whatever means necessary would have been not only the noble thing to do, but frankly, the, the best outcome for all to reassess, re- repackage, rethink, re-whatever – you know, having a full season under one's belt. Yeah, I figured they finished the year. I, I, I thought they'd finish the year. I didn't know. I I would say probably midway through the season, I definitely did not have a ton of confidence that there'd be a year two. But I thought they'd finish year one. I, I, I did. I mean, there were a couple of times where you're like, are they? And then once once Tom Dungeon comes out and, you know, says, hey, I might shut this thing down if – you know, the NFLPA doesn't agree. I remember having a conversation with someone that night and being like, hey, like that seems like a really odd like thing to throw out there because deals with the NFLPA and with the NFL don't move at like some breakneck speed, right? Like you've got CBAs, you've got, a, you know, and the, CBA, the NFL CBA is coming up soon. And why would you give away a negotiating piece if you're D. Smith or the NFLPA, right? Like and the AAF and what can happen there is a negotiating piece. So you you look at all those things and I was like, this is a really weird thing. But I, in the back of my head, I'm like, uh, I, yeah, I can't see it happen. I can't see them shutting the league down because again, you, you figured that the finances were not great, but you know they they, they touted it enough that yeah, yeah, you, you thought that the league was maybe going to stick around the whole year and then. Maybe it just maybe it becomes like the XFL where it's one and done. But no, I I did not think really until maybe the day before it folded when all of a sudden you started to see some things leak out and you started to see some questions of I think you know I, I forget when Johnny Menzel's tweet came over whether it was on Monday or it was on Tuesday of like you know whatever happens blah 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 I forget what the exact tweet was right like but. You start to be like, wait, maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe this is is going to go away much quicker than people thought. And obviously then on April 2nd, it did. And to me, I, obviously I didn't chuckle or anything like that, but the timing to me was was very intriguing and interesting because if they had announced this the day before, I don't know how many people would have actually believed it. Because it would have been on April Fool's Day, and we've all—if you're in the media, you you are on high alert at all times for weird April Fool's things that pop up. I remember one time when I was covering Notre Dame, I spent way too—and this was in like the early days of message boards and things like that, right? I spent a whole bunch of time chasing a rumor that Mike Bray was leaving for uh, another coaching job, which he obviously ended up not doing since he is still at Notre Dame. But I mean, I spent hours chasing that and it turned out that it was just somebody like having an April Fool's, you know, fun little thing. But, oh yeah, like, I mean, you spent chasing it and chasing it, chasing it and obviously not being true and, you know, you didn't write anything about it. But yeah, that was to me since that point, that was, you know, 11 years ago now, 12 years ago, something like that. Like if they had announced it the day before, it would have been really, really interesting to me because I think that there would have been a lot of people who were like, mm, is this actually true? 
so this is obviously a first draft, if you will, of our you know investigation of all this stuff over time. And a lot more is going to play out. But let me ask you just a couple other sort of just general questions. And, and bouncing around is absolutely allowed because that's what this league kind of did, right? So you're forgiven for uh, for having a sort of an ersatz uh, kind of a, a roadmap, I guess, of, of you know this this league's uh, brief but uh, interesting history. So, but what I didn't get uh, either in real time or maybe as it was leaking out, and maybe it wasn't designed to leak out. But there were sort of two things that that seemed to be related to Dundon that I kind of didn't get, uh, and in particular how quick he was. It seemed to push these issues. One you mentioned right, which was sort of the. Uh, relationship uh, formalizing with the players associate that with the NFL, the relationship with the NFL, right? Uh, by the way, why would you do that in public or or have that sort of admitted in public? And I don't understand why so quickly, especially when you didn't have a, a year under your belt yet. Okay. Number that's number one. Number two, I think is I would seems to me based on your reporting and your story uh, with Seth, the, uh, uh, the press perhaps on, Folks like CBS, the television partners, right, which this was and, and comes into clarity now with the XFL. This was a time buy, right? So in media circles, right, this is you are renting out or buying time, not unlike Lyndon LaRouche did back in the day when he was running for president as a crazy, wacky candidate back in the 70s and 80s. Now I'm dating myself. But but you could buy time, right? And and you're responsible for selling the ads and and. The, the difference with the XFL, right, is that, that, that there is a they're coughing up some of the production or all the production costs. Right. So there's a little bit of, of skin in the game. But why would Dundon then also in the midst of the season go directly to the to the jugular on television before, you know, you even have any leverage in, in that respect to, to talk about maybe what year two might look like versus it being a straight time buy? You know, I'll be honest with you. Seth did a lot of that part of the reporting. So I can't give you a great answer on that. I can just tell you from my point of view, I mean, that was one of the questions that I had chased from the jump. And by the jump, I mean January, because like when I was down in training camp, because I had heard rumblings again that maybe they're brought, you know, that this wasn't a true broadcast deal, like where they got rights fees and stuff like that, which I didn't expect it to be. But I, you know, no one could give a straight answer about how that, that contract worked, again, because so much of the league ended up on the financial side being so secretive. And you, know, you, you saw that on so many levels because the team presidents never really received operating budgets. There was, they, if they got a budget for some departments got said, hey, you can buy X amount of media buy in, and this is per team, in Q4. Right. So they were told that. But then when they asked about Q1, they never really got an answer for what they could do as a buy in Q1. And these are the people whose like, job it was to, you know, buy the stuff. <laughs> and they didn't know what they could spend. And then at one point, they, you know, eventually when Tom Dundon co- took over, there was a spending freeze where every, every kind of expense that was any sort of major expense had to be approved through certain people had to be approved through the the home office which was multiple home offices because you had a san francisco home office which was charlie's people and the tech people and you had the tampa home office which was the business people in charlotte which were the football people and then you had other people in new york and actually north dakota and other places around the country it was really a nationwide it was it was a nationwide office that had no central office it, it was kind of that, you know, to me, and to me, that was one of the things that actually didn't make the story that that we had reported out. That were that was one of the challenges because you had people trying to make decisions in two different time zones and three different states, and you had team presidents that were not given budgets, and you had team employees that were trying to figure out what they could do and what they couldn't, all all over the place, and. You know, one of those things was, okay, one of the things I tried to find in that was, well, what was the TV structure? Because to me, a league isn't going to be successful if you're buying time. Because how do most money, how do most leagues make a bunch of money through their TV rights deals? So if you're buying, if you're spending money there, you're not making money. And that to me was one of the things I wanted to find out, both while the league was in existence and then certainly after 
the league folded, that was one of the things I circled. I was like, we need to find this out and get this locked down. I will say to their credit, though, the uh, the production value of the games themselves, I thought was very, very good. It was, but that cost money, man. No, no doubt. And, that, <laughs> and, and, and it turns out that's money that they didn't really have. Yeah. Well, but, but I mean, the, the look and the feel, uh, it was uh, consistent across all of the, the broadcast uh, outlets. Obviously, the uh, the advertisers that they brought on or, or, you know, coaxed in, you know, for how much money, who knows, right, was all sort of centralized and, and whatnot. So, I, you know, you, you give them full marks for that. What I thought was interesting, and maybe this leads to my other my next question on, on the NFL, right, was the arrival, uh, uh, if you will, of the NFL network as part of the television package, right, which at least connotes some kind of of relationship and or okayness with the NFL. So I, that leads me to the general question from your reporting and, and and maybe what you know now, what was the NFL's quote unquote relationship and or of the people that you know in your reporting uh, uh, circles, what was their opinion of the AAF either explicitly or implicitly as this thing was unfolding? I mean, I can, I can tell you more from the team side of things like the the coaches and gms were super excited about it in a lot of ways because it was another evaluation tool for them they were able to get real game tape against like players on a bunch of guys that otherwise you wouldn't see because you gotta remember some of these guys have been out of the nfl for a year or two some of these guys played at small schools so and they never got a shot in the nfl so or they got like one preseason game and it was like 20 snaps, right? So all of a sudden you've got what turned out to be eight, but they were hoping 10 games worth of real film on players against guys who are theoretically NFL bubble, other NFL bubble players, and in some cases guys who have been in the league for a few years. That's invaluable for coaches and GMs because you can evaluate players at a much better level and scouts as well. So that they were the players and, the, and not the players, the coaches and the GMs were were pretty happy that this league was in existence and they scouted it. And I think that to me, the the legacy of this league might end up being if if some of these guys, I think there's uh, the number changes a decent amount, but it's been around 50, right, that ended up getting to the NFL at this moment. And that can change based on the day because some of these guys are end of the roster guys. But they put 50, you know, 50 guys of 416, give or take, in the NFL. That's not too bad. To me, that – and some teams really, you could tell, scouted it more than others. Carolina seems to be a haven for former AAF players. And, and Pittsburgh's brought in a bunch of former AAF players. So you see that, and you're like, okay. Like, so teams clearly paid attention to the league and, and found some value in it. All right, a couple odds and ends, and then I'll I'll, I'll let you go because uh, I, this is uh, I'm sure stirred up a lot of uh, emotions and or <laughs> memories that you thought maybe were gone over the last couple of months. Uh, no way! I mean, we reported the, the story has been only out for a week, and I, right. we, we spent I, we spent I mean I spent really since January reporting it, and, and Seth and I really spent since uh, I guess probably a couple days after the league folded reporting it. So no, this is this is months worth of work. This is ah, this is a blast, man. I'm, I'm glad to talk about this sort of stuff because I found I found the story completely completely interesting on so many levels both levels that that made our piece and then a lot of stuff that frankly we just didn't have room for because i mean you know there's only so much that that you can really write and there's so many angles and tentacles to it well all right so so then you're qualified then to to have some at least uh, uh shall we say hot takes uh but with you know with knowledge right and uh sure. and portorial skill so was it too early the start of the season, the uh, week right after the Super Bowl, despite uh, CBS's, uh, you know, uh, I want to call it promotion, but uh, it, it was certainly known by most fans out there that CBS not only broadcasting the Super Bowl, but was also going to be broadcasting the next week, this AAF thing. Or do you think, again, every, hindsight is twenty twenty, that waiting maybe a few weeks or, you know, not unlike what the WFL did back in the 70s, starting in June-ish, uh, or maybe even later in the spring might have been a better idea? Or is it too early to even assess? I mean, I think it's maybe still early to assess, but I think they may, I think their start date, was, as far as when in the calendar year they started, was not the problem at all. I thought that was smart, and I think it's why you're seeing Vince McMahon have that schedule, a similar schedule next year, right? And 
I think that's the smart way to go. And here's why, because so you have the schedule come out and if your real thought and your real goal and the way you're going to get players is that they all want to prove themselves to get back to the NFL. Well, if you start in June, that's not going to happen because you're either going to have players who are like, you know what? I don't want to, I don't want to take a chance here because if I get hurt, I have no shot of getting to the NFL this year. And then, you know, or if the season ends, okay, my body's beat up because, yeah, it's not NFL football, but it's still professional football, and your body's still taking a beating, right? So if my season's done in September or October, which all of a sudden then you're competing against the NFL, which why would any league want to do that? Like you're not going to win, and college football for that matter, which is on so many nights of the week. You're not going to win, and you're not going to get TV coverage and all that. Your body's going to be beat up. So if you go to a team like – you've got much less chance of sticking. So I think for a lot of reasons, the timing on it of starting in February, ending in late April, early May makes a ton of sense on every level because you still have football on the brain. You have people excited about the Super Bowl and you have people talking about the Super Bowl. You have football still on the mind. You're getting a head start on March Madness. You are getting a head start on opening day in baseball. You're not conflicting with the NBA or NHL playoffs. And that, that time from February to mid-March really is, you know, you're not competing with golf. You're not competing with tennis. Not that there's a ton of overlap potentially there, but you're not, you, you, there's an open window in that calendar where it's regular season NBA, regular season NHL, and really regular season college basketball that are the three big sports, right? In that, like, February to mid-March range. Well, okay. I mean, th- not, none of those sports has this amazing, like, I can't miss quality to those games, unless you're a diehard fan, because there's 82 of them <laughs> in the NBA, and, you know, there's a, the, and the NHL, and, and college basketball's got 30 or 40. So there's a window there. So to me, the timing on that makes sense. And if you're going to make this happen and you're going to want to attract players who are going to maybe graduate to the NFL, which was a term that a couple of people use around the AAF, that's the time to do it because you're, you're allowing guys to get a look. Teams are going to look at guys. And then after the draft's over, if your league's close to done, they still know their needs. So you're competing against undrafted rookies. And a lot of cases, you're maybe a little bit more experienced versus going in late. You're coming in. If you get signed by a team in April or May, you have time to learn the playbook before training camp. You have time to get acclimated. You have time to maybe impress. And oh yeah, you're probably in as good, if not better shape, as long as you're not injured, than a lot of the guys who are coming in either as rookies or as veterans that you're probably competing with for roster spots. So there's so much benefit, I think, on so many levels from the player standpoint and from the window of marketability standpoint that it just makes sense to me that that, that, that window where the AAS started is the right window. Because if you start too late, you know, too far down the road, you run into a situation. I've talked to some guys who played arena football about this because that arena season starts later on, right? So the arena season, and even some Canadian guys, but mostly the arena season guys I've talked to, they're like, yeah, like I come out of that arena season, and if, I'm, if I get signed by an NFL team, I'm going three days later to an NFL training camp, and I'm trying to make a team, and my body's exhausted, and I'm trying to learn a playbook. That, that's, you're putting yourself at a disadvantage if you're a player. Yeah, that seems it. You know, yeah, it almost seems like uh, you're setting yourself up uh, with this schedule that uh, the AAF started, maybe the XFL as well. Is, is it becomes more out of the shoot, more complementary, uh, if you will, to the NFL. Right, and and the, the AAF, that's what they wanted to be. I mean, Bill Polian made that crystal clear that that was what they were trying to do. Like we, I remember we had talked when I was in San Antonio and he, I was like, well, what if the NFL wanted to experiment with rules changes with the AAF? You know, he's like, well, if they we want to talk about it, we'll talk about it. Like they, they seemed open to anything that could get them tied in with the NFL because they knew that that was a path to success. That was, I, to me, that to me, and, and some people verbalize this, but no one really would, you know, totally say it. I, I, maybe some people even did. I, I don't remember at this point, but yeah, 
the the end game was to try and tie in with the NFL because why wouldn't that be the end game? You become the developmental league for the NFL and you can argue whether or not the NFL would really want that because college football is a pretty good developmental league right now. But you you look at it, well, why wouldn't you want to try to be the G League to the NFL's NBA? You know, like the, the G League comparison to the in the NBA. Like, why wouldn't you want to be that? Why wouldn't you think that that would be an option for you down the road if you can be successful? Well, this is also very, this is a very, uh, almost like corporate America, right? Where uh, the startups uh, kind of, you know, uh, take the bullets, uh, if you will, uh, and, you know, either get acquired by the big entity or lessons learned from big ent- by big entity to recreate that on their on their own terms, right? So I'm Absolutely. sure the NFL is looking at, at you know, a, a supposedly much better funded XFL. We'll see what this looks like, you know, go next year through a similar lens. No, I would think so. You never know. I mean, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. We'll see what happens. I at this point and on a lot of radio shows and things that I've talked about this story on, I've kind of said the same thing because that's one of the main questions that you get over and over is. So what does this mean? Why? Why do people keep trying to do spring football? Right. And I'm like, because the interest is there and I think people still see a need and people still think that there is an interest in spring football. And to me, the one thing the AAF told you is that, yeah, there is some interest there because you look at the ratings and they were solid and the football worked. So I think that that to me, if I'm the NFL, I'm intrigued by that and, and it's something I file away. Now, what does that mean for the future? What does that mean for the XFL? Who knows? I, you know, anyone who, say, who sits there and says the XFL is absolutely going to succeed or absolutely going to fail, uh, that's a tough thing to say in either way because the XFL has something that the AAF didn't, and that is somebody in Vince McMahon who you know he has the money, you know he has the funding, he also knows marketing. He might be the best marketer in sports ever. Now, there's a hot take for you. You, you. you were asking for hot takes before. He might be because look at what he's done with pro wrestling. Look at what he's done with the WWE. And look what he's done whenever anyone's challenged his organization in the last, what, I'm 38. And I, pro wrestling to me was like, you know, awesome as a kid. So we're talking the last three decades at least. I mean, anyone who's come up and challenged it, where are they? They're not really around. And that's because Vince McMahon knows how to win. And, and it, it, it's in the story as well with Tom Dunton hinting that, of basically saying, you don't want to go up against Vince McMahon. And, and other people I talked to was like, no, you don't want to go straight up against Vince McMahon. So to me, Vince McMahon monetarily has, the, you know, he at least has the funds. He also lost at this once already. And I, I don't think you go back in this again to try to lose again. You go in to try to win a second time around. And I think that, he again so much of this is just speculation of my own opinion but to me he's going into this with the intent on finally building a successful spring football league and what i think the aaf might have given is a football roadmap to success because that was the biggest problem with the original xfl the football was bad if you remember like it was it was not good and if you could take that, that what the AAF did with football and take Vince McMahon's market, marketing strategy and finances and ability to kind of, you know, maybe do some TV stuff, then that to me, you've got a shot. Would I sit here and say, I think it's going to be successful and it's going to be what really works? No, I can't. I, I couldn't say that. I don't think anyone can. Uh, because you just don't know. Because also, let's be real, each time one of these leagues come, pops up and then fails, there's a little bit of that erosion of like, do I really want to go through this and watch this again? Yeah, we're also living in a time where, where the economic, uh, there hasn't been sort of a, a dip in sort of economic, uh, macroeconomic uh, uh, cycles uh, at all, right? So, you know, th- those things play into it too, I think. And, and you know, we, we we're talking about something that's sort of uh, you know, there seems to be a, a litany of, of new leagues and, and, and a growth in pro sports, right, that I think has been, I would argue, economically unchecked from a, a cycle, uh, shall we say. So that that also, to me, is is sort of interesting. All right, I have two more quest, quick questions for you, uh, and then I promise I'll let you go. So number one, what, what about the markets themselves, right? Now, on paper, and you already alluded to, you know, the issues around Salt Lake, et cetera, but on paper, right, it seems like it was sort of the old uh, – uh, canard or the old, uh, I don't know, uh, tried and true uh, approach to markets that have historically been underserved 
and or uh, have flirted with professional football over the years, right? So Memphis and Birmingham and San Antonio uh, and Orlando, those to me don't, and frankly, warmer weather uh, environments, right? Uh, You know, at least those four seem to be not bad choices on paper. I would agree. I I think I would say five of their eight choices were good as far as teams go. No, not everyone ended up being really successful in the box office and in, in penetrate, you know, in market penetration. But I would argue, I would argue basically every team except for Salt Lake, Atlanta, and Arizona were smart choices. They were. Uh, San Diego was a brilliant choice for them because they had just lost their NFL team. There were people who were angry and annoyed by that. I know because I have some friends in San Diego. Well, all right, take advantage of that because there's a thirst there for football. Orlando, big football market. Birmingham, big football market. And and how the San Antonio, big football market, and really the most successful one that they had. But what they also did, and this was smart, was how they allocated their players was they brought they brought college players who played in that area to those teams. So Trent Richardson is on the Birmingham it was on the Birmingham Iron. Well, okay, there are there is a segment of Alabama fans that might want to go see Trent Richardson play again. That was their thought. The the AF thought of why they allocated things as they did. Now some that made some places more difficult than others to sell to get players to and it made you know there was some balance there that was tough and I mean it doesn't make any sense to go into kind of all the machinations of how they did that now, right? Because it's it's over and done with. But the way, and if you really are really interested, you can Google my name with uh, the a couple of the early AAF stories I wrote, and I, I broke it all down of how all that happens. But the way they allocated players was smart within the markets that they chose because they were giving them, in a lot of cases, marketable stars, or I'll use stars in quotes, but marketable players in those cities other than a handful. I mean, in, even in, in Atlanta, which to me was the hardest market for them to put in as far as trying to get real attention and penetration, you still had Aaron Murray there. And Aaron Murray uh, was a, a huge name at Georgia, right? But that's a tough market to be in because not only are you competing against an NFL team and the Falcons and then a whole bunch of other college and pro teams but you're also competing against an, an MLS team that has done really, really well on the market. So you only have so many marketing dollars, you know, only so much attention and so many marketing dollars and stuff to go around that to me, that was a really tough market. And then you had all the stuff go with them on the field that made it very, very challenging. And Arizona was kind of, to me, a similar situation because again, you're in an NFL market and that that's the one thing with the XFL. I'm curious to see how that goes because it seems like they're going to some NFL markets. And I'm curious how that's going to play out. Now, I mean, and the other thing, too, with, with the way that the AAF did it is I know why you go to Arizona, because it's warm and all of that. But it's not like that's the number one NFL market, right? Like, it's not. Let's just be real. It's not like Dallas. It's not like New York. It's not like some of these other places as far as where there's this, this rapid, rapid fan base. The fan base is good in Arizona, but it's not Dallas or New York so or you know, Green Bay or, or Pittsburgh. So to me, I look at those things and I say, that's why some of those cities they chose were mistakes. But I think on the whole, they made smart decisions with the cities they went in because they're cities that want football. They're cities that have had interest in NFL teams before or had XFL teams or World League teams or USFL teams before, and they showed that they could be successful then. So that was a smart play to me in the cities that they chose. Yeah, and you talk about the XFL, right? I mean, you know, seven of the eight teams are in NFL uh, cities uh, next year. So, you know, with the exception of St. Louis. So <laughs> I don't know. It's going to be interesting to watch uh, MetLife Stadium in uh, the, you know, near the end of February and see how many people are showing up for an XFL game in a, in New York. Okay, uh, here's my last question. If if it, Now, this is a hot take, right, for sure, and I'm sure things will sort of play out in the months and years to come. But if you had to kind of, on a short piece of paper, kind of bullet point out, like, who you think the victims and the villains of this story are so far, any thoughts about who might fit those two categories, or is it still too early to tell, given all that? Well, I mean, the, vi- the victims are easy. The victim is... The, the quote-unquote victims, I mean, it really they were, are the rank and file, the, the social media manager, the media relations employee, the vice president of ticketing, the 
people who move, left other jobs on the business side of things or on the low level coaching side of things to take these jobs to because they thought they had a three year runway because that was what was told said over and over and over again publicly, right? That they had this runway and then they in some cases they quit jobs that were stable and that were good. In other cases, they move from one city to another. They take a chance. This is their first job on because this is a chance to get into pro sports and then they have a job for less than a year. And in a lot of those cases, these are people that don't, that aren't rich, you know, they aren't making huge amount of money. They didn't have some of the cushion that, that maybe other people did. And all of a sudden, it's not like they were given a three month window of like, Hey, you're out of, you know, you get three months severance, you're out of a job. It was Hey, wait, I'm learning on social media that the, my, the league I work for is going to fold. And, oh, wait, I'm, my last paycheck was yesterday, like, you know, type of thing, or next week or whatever it is. Like, all of a sudden, that's a really tough situation for a lot of people. That, and that's not an insignificant enough a number of an insignificant number of people that had to deal with that and had to go through it. And in having conversations with some of those people since some of them are still looking for jobs. Some of them have found gigs. Some of them have found gigs because of the AAF that have been better gigs, but it's still a really tough situation because there are some people who have to move again. And that's again, part of being in a startup and you go in eyes wide open, but that was way more to me of a Silicon Valley way of startup versus the pro sports when you're told X. So to me, those are the people that that probably hurt the most with this because they just that you know I, it's not play yeah play, for players it's it's unfortunate too but for players they still got eight weeks of film out of it right at, at, at worst you got eight weeks of film and and a decent payday out of it. Some of the, the low-level business employees, that that was not the case. You get a line on a resume, but I mean, that's a tougher thing to 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 work. And these people on the business side of things specifically, I mean, they worked a lot. I, I know one person I talked to with one team, they maybe took three days off total from October until the league folded. Like, I, I'm not saying just like Monday through Friday type thing. I'm saying three days period, and then all of a sudden it's gone the next day and they're just left without a job. And that, that's, that's hard. That's really, really hard because a lot of these people put their, took big chances on it and put their, their heart and soul into it. And you know, that, that's not necessarily something that you see with, with a lot of, of what's been out there. Do you uh, think you're going to continue to report on this story? Do you does the XFL similarly interest you? Does ESPN want you to or encourage you to to do so? Is there is there a book in all of this? Uh, where, where are you? Where are you in relation to this story going forward? If at all? Oh man, I uh, I don't know. Um, I I will do whatever my bosses want. How is that for an answer? Whatever they ask me to do, I will do it, and. Uh, yeah, I, I'd be lying if I said that there wasn't some intrigue to kind of keep following up on things, even in the t the week since the story has run, has been published. I, I've still kept up on some stuff. There's some legal things that need to play out, some bankruptcy things that need to play out that you're paying attention to still. I, I think there will be potentially more stories that pop up with this. Uh, you know, if if say five or six AAF guys end up making NFL rosters. Uh, that, I think that's an interesting story. You know, I, so I think there will be things I will pay attention to, that, and I'm sure I won't be the only one to pay attention to them throughout all of this, and, and probably the same thing with Seth, uh, although I can't speak for him. But, I, yeah, I, I'll keep paying attention, and if my bosses want me to keep covering it, and my bosses want me to cover the XFL next year, whatever whatever it is, uh, you know, I'm game. I... Uh, like I said, I think at the jump, I, I like finding interesting stories. I like being put on interesting stories. And I think as this proved out, this certainly was one.
Well, now, it just gets more curious and curious now, doesn't it? Uh, what a story this Alliance of American Football thing uh, is becoming. And, um, you know, I hate to say we enjoy uh, the fact that uh, it just keeps on giving. You know, no one wants to see failure and, uh, and, and uh, it devolve into uh, lawsuits and people wanting their money back and bankruptcy and all that stuff. But we are intrigued uh, by all this uh, kind of stuff, whether it happened uh, 100 years ago or 100 days ago. And uh, the AAF uh, clearly is a more recent variety of come and gone. And uh, we will continue to pursue uh, this story as uh, events warrant. And I suspect that uh, both Michael uh, and his colleague at ESPN.com, Seth Wickersham, uh, will probably have a, more than a few things to further on this story as it uh, continues to unfold and unwind. And uh, rest assured that uh, we'll keep in touch with them as well as our pal uh, uh, Connor Orr at Sports Illustrated and any others, frankly, who uh, kind of, uh, you know, progress this story further and as events warrant. You can, uh, like I said, to find this article, which I highly recommend if you haven't read it yet, uh, on ESPN.com that uh, Seth and Michael Rothstein wrote uh, just a couple of weeks ago called Inside the Short, Unhappy Life of the Alliance of American Football. Uh, you will find that on ESPN.com as well as all their writings. Uh, you can also follow Michael uh, on uh, Twitter at Mike Rothstein. That's R-O-T-H-S-T-E-I-N. Uh, and uh, Seth Wickersham uh, is uh, also uh, followable on Twitter at Seth Wickersham. What else? Uh, oh, yeah. The clip at the beginning of the show, it was uh, from the uh, CBS Sports Network uh, broadcast from uh, week two, uh, featuring, uh, as uh, uh, hinted, right, the two at the time and frankly, at the uh, end of the abrupt end of the season, the two arguably best teams uh, in the alliance uh, in its short life, the Orlando Apollos at uh, the San Antonio Commanders. That was at the home field of the Commanders, the Alamo Dome, of course. And uh, that's uh, Ben Holden and uh, Adam Archuleta on the uh, on the microphones there for uh, that game in the second week. And uh, you heard their enthusiasm of how uh, the first week had unfolded, but uh, obviously uh, weeks later, it was no longer to be. So we thank uh, Michael for uh, allowing us to uh, go deeper into the AAF story. And we also want to uh, remind you uh, that you can find uh, our earlier episode on the AAF with uh, uh, our pal at Sports Illustrated, Connor Orr. That was our episode number 113, as well as all of our almost 120 episodes now worth of stuff. Any episode, all kinds of sports and leagues and teams and people and personalities two and a half years worth of stuff. It is available for you uh, to download, uh, stream, and or otherwise enjoy at goodseatsstillavailable.com. Uh, you're going to find all of our old episodes there. You'll find uh, some uh, some great imagery related to those shows. You'll find all of the links uh, to various books and other media that you can uh, purchase, uh, especially if we featured an author or a documentarian. You will also find all so- our social media feeds. On Twitter, you'll find us at Still. Uh, on uh, Instagram, you will find us at Good Seats Still Available. Uh, you will find a, a Facebook page devoted to our show as well. All the links are there, as well as uh, links to uh, signing up for our weekly newsletter. There's a link there. You can just fill that in, and uh, we will uh, get you a little advance warning as to what uh, our next week's episodes are going to be. And you could also send us email either directly from the site. You'll find a little uh, a little mini page there devoted to that. Or you can just send us to it directly, for God's sakes. Go ahead. And that's uh, hello at good seats available, excuse me, good seats still available.com. Yes, hello at good seats <laughs> still available.com. You think I would have gotten the website address uh, correct by now, but there you go. Uh, what else? Our friends at uh, Podfly Productions, uh, once again, coming through, Jerry Payne in particular. Thank you, kind sir. And Podfly Productions is the place to go if you're getting going on the podcast thing or just uh, kind of scratching the surface and, and trying to figure out whether this thing is this medium and uh, something you just want to you know get out there into the world uh, in audio form is uh, is worth the effort. Well, Podfly's got you covered. Give them a check out at podfly.net. Okay, we uh, thank you kindly for listening this far. And uh, yet again, here's our opportunity to play in its entirety the Ontic uh, Alliance theme song, ultimately the official theme song of the Alliance of American Football to uh, to play us out. We got a good three minutes of this, so sit back and enjoy the audio stylings of the old AAF. And until next week, uh, the ticket window is now closed. Take care, everybody. Bye. <laughs>